Okie doke. Well, welcome everybody. And um, we'll hit the solar news first because there is almost no solar news given that it's, it's the holiday period. Um, other than the standard so-and-so built a hundred megawatt thing, um, you know, then um, I kind of tend to ignore those because they happen all the time. Um, I did see an article, GAF, GAF Energy has mm -hmm. come out with a new solar shingle product. And what, what struck me about this, we've, we've dealt with solar shingles before and I've ranted a bit in the past that I think solar shingles are kind of a dumb idea. They're trying to solve a problem that I don't think exists or there are better ways of solving that problem. But these particular ones, they're actually 64 inches by 17 inches by one inch thick. Now it was the one inch thick that got me. And the reason is they have to include electronic devices because of the rapid shutdown issue. So now you're okay. putting one inch thick solar shingles, which sounds a lot like a solar panel that's just stuck onto your roof. You How know. heavy? Uh, 10 pounds for each shingle, and they will generate 45 watts. And of that 17 inch wide surface, only about eight or nine inches is photovoltaic because the rest is overlap. And um, mm -hmm. I don't see why, what it's doing, you know, I mean, it's a thing. So if you've got a specific application for it, great, they've got another product for it, but boy, it seems like, like a solution in search of a problem to me, so. Um, how much is that, I'm just curious, how much, if you translated that same surface area into a, a standard size panel, how many watt, is that a 200 watt panel or is that a? It's about, it's about the same length, but half the width of a standard panel. So, um, you know, you'd be looking well, that's only at a 90, that's a 90 watt panel then if, once you, if it's only 45 watts. Yeah, so it's about half the wattage of a okay. traditional, cause you get about a 400 watt panel in mm -hmm. double the size. So you get about 200 watts, this is getting about 90 watts for the same okay. size. But remember you're getting overlap there. So mm -hmm. that's kind of not true a hundred percent, but still, that's a lot of weight, a lot of effort, a lot of stuff up there um, without a lot of practical benefit to my way of thinking. Um, the CPUC, the California Public Utility Commission, um, apparently they are in the act of trying to make uh, solar more difficult in California. So uh, they're proposing higher utility access fees and lower net median meter payment uh, requirements. So Isn't that the same state that mandated solar? Yes, yes, <laughs> different committee though, different committee. So um, yeah, they've mandated solar, but now they're saying we're not gonna pay you for it if you overproduce. So then what that ends up doing is basically pushing people into, cause they also mandated battery backup on the buildings. So uh, it's, it's basically pushing towards, you know, independent or at least self-consumption of the solar that you generate. If you're not going to get, you know, retail for sending it back to the grid, you are going to try and consume as much as possible of what you're generating. And you can use batteries to do that. You know, store what, you're use, what you have when you have excess rather than sending it back to the grid and then use that stored rather than drawing it from the grid. So, so I think what these, what these policies end up doing is just pushing people to, uh, to, to install more batteries, you know, more battery backup. Mm -hmm. So those were the, those are really the only two items of note over the holiday period that I saw in the news. Uh, anybody before we, I, I thought this would be a good time Everybody does their best records of 2021 and things like that. So I'm going to do our predictions for 2022 so we can look back mm -hmm. in a year and say, man, were we wrong, um, which is typically what happens with predictions or duh, of course. Mm -hmm. So um, anybody have any other items before we hit into that? 
I do. I've, I've got a question, Jay, kind of a to you or to anybody, uh, just kind of trying to brainstorm something. I've got my place, my farm, which is off the grid. And typically it was set up so that I wasn't planning on having anybody living there in the winter. So I would keep the temperature down lower and not use as much electricity. Uh, things change, have a father-in-law living there now. So I find out that the uh, battery bank that I put in there is just slightly too much. And like last night, uh, you know, it was slightly too little so that the generator kicks on and the generator goes through a whole cycle to completely charge the batteries. I was considering alternatives. I've been, I had thought long-term I would put a wind turbine out there. Um, and I, I think that's fairly straightforward. I was looking for other ideas and I was just curious. Um, it would have to be a turbine kind of an idea. And I was thinking, I also have uh, a cistern out there which takes half of the roof and the water from half the roof. Um, do you have any idea where I, I could calculate it myself? I'm sure I could figure it out, but in case you know of anything, I was thinking about putting in a, an above ground cistern for the front half of the house, collect the water, and then if I need, you know, a couple uh, kilowatt hours, I don't maybe I don't know if it's practical or not. If I have a big water tank, that would drain from the that big water tank into the current cistern and have an overflow. Maybe I could pull off a couple extra kilowatt hours and have extra water storage at the same time. Is there any way to, is there any resource like that you've seen to calculate a water turbine? You know, if I have 10,000 gallons, how much could I think I could get for power? Yeah, it, well, it mostly deals with um, basically head, head size, which is the differential in height yep. from one location to the other, yep. and, and um, size of your pipe, essentially. Right. Those are the two factors. Right, um, how much pressure I'll have going through there and for how long? Yeah, I remember a few years ago, the Canadian government had some really good micro hydro resources mm -hmm. um, when I did some research for a textbook. Um, and that's where I got a lot of that. You can, there are calculations on how, how you can calculate based on head mm -hmm. and, and flow. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it really is, you know, like wind, it's a fluid dynamic um, equation. And the right. only difference between a wind turbine and a, and a micro hydro is typically that, um, well, it's the density of the liquid in this case. Right, much, better with, much better with liquid. Yeah, it's about 10 times, if I remember right, the density right. is get 10 times the power. And of course, the, the constancy of the flow. So you can tend mm -hmm. to predict that. Um, so you can look into it. I, I know they have those, uh, I think they call them Gosh, it was right there. It's like, I, I got it mixed up with Pelotron. It's a name like that. It's a kind of- It's a, called a Pelton. Pelton? Pelton. 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 Yeah. Can you yeah, spell that? Do you, Pelton? P-E-L? B-E-L-T-O-N? -E P-E-L-T-O-N or something akin okay. to that. Yeah. To... Yeah, if I remember right, they're just kind of paddles that flow through. It's a kind of turbine. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if you have a, a constant stream like that, Micro hydro is a great source of energy. Um, the, the other thing I've got is a big pond. And currently the big pond, when I bought the farm, the guy who was there was an older guy, had let it kind of die down. So it's about seven or eight feet lower than it should be. But if I you know, patch the, the retaining wall back up and put a, uh, what I'm thinking about is in the old days, if you did, if you had a water mill, you'd have like a, what they called a sluice and you'd open the, the thing and you'd be able to run it through when you wanted to. Yeah. Um, that would be another way with much more water and much more power. Um, that's just a little further away from the house. I'd have, I'd, I'd have a pretty long run to the house, maybe half a mile, um, which I, I don't know how much, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the wiring through the woods would not be the, the most fun. Right. Um, and the voltage drop issue. But um, if I can do it with a little one, I thought I might look into the bigger one. Well, what about a heat stove if it's just heat that's the primary issue? I can do that, but it's that's not as fun. It's wonderful. <laughs> it's it's it's, uh, it's <laughs> I yes, I, I could put I, yes, and, and frankly, I I have 140 acres all wooded, so yeah. there's plenty of wood. But Jay, you're not playing along with the right uh, <laughs> the right team here. Yeah, two things with the Pelton is one, you have to keep debris out of them. And the second thing, you have to keep them from freezing. Okay, yeah. Um, so if you're looking for doing water storage, that would be a major concern where I live. 
Um, yeah. Something else you could do with your pond, if you have an overflow on the pond, basically, mm -hmm. is uh, put in a ram pump and pump that water back up closer to your house and mm -hmm. into a storage tank and then just run it off of that because that would be a constant, as long as you have water going through there, mm -hmm. it's gonna fill that tank. And I, ramp I pumps think... are pretty easy to build. Now, but that, how much power would that take? Ramp pumps take no power. No power? It's, it's all water dynamic. It's done by the, basically water hammer on a pipe every time it's slammed shut on a little uh, well, uh, it... check valve, then it, pressurizes and pushes you lose about seven to one but for every seven volumes you're pumping one volume okay. and since there's no electricity you're pumping constantly as long as you have a flow that, and then well, from this, there you could make that work for you for electricity the the pond in particular doesn't have much of a flow once it fills up it's a slow thing and i'll yeah. just pick out the power when i need it the other issue is that's about 50 feet or more below the height of my house Okay, ramp pumps, if you have enough of a flow, enough of a run, they'll pump okay. fairly high. I mean, they, it's, it's interesting. You can look them up and um, sure. there's brochures out there that basically specify the length of your run, the size of your pipe, and mm -hmm. how far you can pump it. Okay. Uh, it's R-A-M or R-A-M-P? Ram, R-A-M. Okay, got it. Okay. Okay, thanks. I'll take a look at that too. Interesting. Okie doke. Um, okay, so when we get into uh, predictions here, uh, I was hoping what we'll get is a, a dynamic conversation about that because people have opinions. Um, but I will say, in preparation for this, I looked online all of the supposed experts in the world um, of, of solar and what they're predicting for 2022. And it's, it's one of the problems I think we run into with predictions of any sort. We see that with the EIA predictions. People tend to look at what's just happened and say whatever just happened is going to continue to happen, you know, with, with maybe minor tweaks. So with, with a grain of salt there, I'll tell you what their predictions are. Then I'll give you my five predictions myself, and hopefully people will argue. Um, okay, the, the experts say, carbon-based fuel prices will continue to rise. Okay, seems a fair prediction because you're spreading it over quite a number of industries there. Um, When's your starting point? I guess starting in today. <laughs> it, it's, it's higher today than it was a year ago, but I mean, it, you know, if they, I, I'm just curious, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a fairly safe predict, predictions to say if you have a fixed quantity of a thing and there is continued demand, prices yeah. will tend to increase. Over um, a long enough time, yeah. Yeah, solar, distributed solar will continue to grow and prices will continue to fall. Again, fairly safe prediction. Some are predicting as much as double uh, installation of 2021 in 2022. I think that's probably too aggressive for prediction number three, the growth within China will impact supply chain issues. All right, I think that again is a fairly safe prediction. So I think even if there is demand for the growth to double, it's not going to double because there won't be the product available for it to double. So, so that would be something I would add into that, which then leads to an increased focus on local production of materials which again seems a realistic response. Um, no shortage of oil, especially Texas-based oil. Apparently they're expanding a lot of oil production within Texas. Um, I don't know what's motivating that. I'm not an expert in oil. You would think that if prices remain low, which they are pretty low compared historically, that there wouldn't be a whole lot of demand for new exploration or new oil. But your first prediction said it was going to go up. Yeah. They're listening to you. Yeah, I know. Well, it depends when you're talking about how much. And, and if you're talking about local, local or global, you know, they're talking global demand. And largely, a lot of that's being driven by India and, and China. So uh, if you look at U.S. consumption of energy, totally, we're at kind of a plateau. We're not really 
increasing our energy demands at the moment. That may change. Uh, as prices decrease, demand probably increases. But for the moment, and some of that may be also COVID-based, um, there has been a plateau over the last two or three years of energy demand domestically. Um, EVs, electric, electric vehicles, will take at least 10% of the global automobile share, possibly more. Um, I think that's an interesting and, and probably, again, a pretty safe prediction. Um, and one of the things that may drive that, at least here in the US, is pushing by the Biden administration to increase the tax credit for fully electric vehicles from 7,500 to 12,500 for an EV. If made by union labor. If made by, well, okay. And uh, the Ford Lightning, we talked about that last week. You know, if it's got a retail price of 40,000, 12,500 off that is pretty significant. Uh, mm -hmm. My um, cynical side tends to think that, of course, lithium ion prices are decreasing pretty dramatically. That if you increase the subsidy, which is basically what you're increasing there when you talk about a tax credit, mm -hmm. you're just going to artificially jack up the price of an electric vehicle. Because the car salesman's going to go, well, the retail price is 40000 but for you, it's really twenty seven five. when in reality, they should probably just sell it to you for twenty seven five. you know, because they're getting the benefit of that tax. Yeah, Jay. Has anybody considered uh, making that a subsidy for putting a, a 220-volt charger in garages? Because that 1000 bucks would really, A, promote it and be hook people. Yeah, I know that our utility company will give you, I think it's like a $250 credit if you do that um, for electric vehicle chargers. So you're seeing some utilities that are pushing because they look at it as saying, hey, you buy an EV, now you're buying your, your, your fuel from us instead of from Exxon or whatever. So they're trying to get you in there. Um, and of course, uh, we talked about that last week, where even with the lightning or any of these, if you've got the charging station thrown in, well, you're, you're putting a 21st century technology into a 18th or 19th century home, and there's a lot of cost preparing that home for the kind of amperage that's required. So um, I don't know if, that there's discussion at the national level for providing tax credits for that. Although- I think there is, Jay. Is there? If, if, I'm thinking it's like 1500, if I'm remembering. Is that mm -hmm. part of the, uh, like the tax credit that's for the 26%, like it's considered weatherization or putting yeah. in insulated windows, that kind of thing? I'm thinking it's a tax incentive. Yeah, part of the uh, investment tax credit perhaps, I don't know, or separate. That'd be nice because, I mean, I already did it. So, you know, we live here in Appalachia. We don't, we don't wait for the government to subsidize these things, right? We just, Amen. we just find some cheap electrician intern to come out and say, hey, Eduardo, you need to practice, install this thing, you know, and I'll feed you lunch. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I have a level two charger at 60. 15 amps, uh, it costs less than $250. Uh, I, I can't, I mean, maybe more power uh, is more money, but um, $1,000 is probably high. Uh, that's all I had to say. Yeah, I know that the, um, for, for us, you know, again, for a, a 20 amp circuit or whatever, it's not going to be a big deal to run a 20 amp circuit with just a 240 plug uh, to prepare for that. I know the charging stations themselves are, you can get them for, like you said, 200, 250, 300 bucks. But, um, but like the Ford Lightning is an 80 amp circuit. So I worry that if you've got an 80 amp circuit required, now you've probably got some major electrical work because you got to run new wires. You got you to make sure your circuit breaker box can handle that capacity and and things like that. So you may be looking at a couple thousand dollars to to prepare for an 80 amp 
charging station, not even cost, not even talking about the cost of the charging station itself, just getting your service panel box upgraded and rewired and all of that. So, and so that's going like to be who knows how to do it. Yeah, or willing to do it right now. Willing if it's it, not yeah. a major job, they're kind of like, listen, I've got 75 people ahead of you. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, the next one can is, I, yeah. Can I, can I ask, what's the current, you said is they predicted 10%. What's the current percentage of EV sales? Do you know? I know that in the US, it's around 2%. That's what I was thinking too. So how do they expect, you, they think they're going to get five times the sales this year? Yeah, well, again, this is worldwide. So in some countries, okay. it's significantly more. But we are looking at most every automobile um, manufacturer moving towards a fully electric fleet. Now, mm -hmm. that's going to take a number of years. But um, I could see that happening, uh, especially when you get some heavy duty rollouts like the Ford Lightning. Mm -hmm. um, you get, but, but even at that, they're kind of slow. Everybody's slow. Yeah, I, 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 I understand they keep saying that because they're, they're told they have to say that or else they'll get in trouble. But yeah, I mean, I, I see the practicality of all the things we always talk about, you know, building out the infrastructure and, and it seems aggressive to say they're going to sell nothing but EVs in the near future. Yeah, I would say, you know, maybe 10% worldwide is certainly fine. Maybe 4% in the U.S., yeah with most okay. of that happening out in California, which is where most of it is happening today anyway. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, we, we may see it. I mean, we may, see, and maybe it's, it's not fully electric. Maybe it's like my situation where you have plug-in hybrids and things like that. But, but it, I was just actually down at the car dealership getting the oil changed on my truck. And uh, um, they were telling me that every car that they've got ordered for the next, four months is already sold. So, you know, there's oh, yeah. kind of nothing in the supply chain. And, and I, so I don't really see a major rejiggering of, um, mm -hmm. of our automobile fleet, given that you can't get cars easily. So yeah. uh, the next projection that I saw everywhere is one of my personal um, pet peeves is that hydrogen, you know, is going to be a thing. And, and I'm just like, really, come on. You know, we hear this every year, all the time. Um, I think it's really just, again, the, the fossil fuel industry trying to move that into an industry that they understand they can control the supply, they can do all of that stuff. But, but I think it's something for investment bankers to talk about, but real people aren't going to do anything with it. You know, I mean, we have enough trouble with an electric vehicle infrastructure. Imagine the hydrogen infrastructure for, for automobiles or something like that. Um, they've tried it in California. It's failed miserably. Uh, I, just, I just don't see it. Again we've, again, we've touched on this in the past. There may be applications for it when you start to get to mm -hmm. a certain level of renewable energy. So rather than curtail the, the uh, electric generation from a wind farm or a solar array, because there is no demand on the grid, you could use that to manufacture hydrogen. But then you've still got shipping and storing and, and that kind of issues for hydrogen. And somebody pointed out in the comments or an email after that discussion, will that not require a great deal of water? And where is this water source? How are you going to, you're not necessarily co-locating a wind farm next to a a source of that much water. So, um, you know, and that's assuming you're doing hydrolysis. Um, you may be cracking, um, oh, you know, natural most, gas. yeah, natural gas is the main source for hydrogen at the moment. And mm -hmm. of course that's not exactly green. So, um, greener, green, greener, yeah. Greener. Greener, <laughs> isher. Sure. He's, he's not quite is... as dead. He's not quite as dead as he was. <laughs> He's not quite as pregnant. Guy, the other guy's deader, right? <laughs> Jay, yeah. this is this is Gabe. Um, you're, yeah. I think you're spot on on hydrogen. If I can say one other thing, just going back to your question on oil, when I left the industry about a year ago, um, we could uh, produce new oil for about thirty-five dollars a barrel. 
Um, today, West Texas Intermediate is about $76 a barrel. So that's your margin. Okay. Um, so so yeah. once to, for oil production to projects to stop, you got to get it down in the $35 to $40 uh, range um, before the, the oil companies will quit investing. Yeah. Dave, just, is, that, is that just normal? Is that shale too? Or is shale more expensive? Yeah, that's an average across everything. You know, offshore is probably the cheapest, one of the cheaper oils to produce right now because you can get so much volume. Um, but um, yeah, that's just an average. I think I think that would shale is going to be in there somewhere, thirty-five to forty, maybe. But okay, it's, it's all in in the thirty to forty range. Yep, my personal sort of uninformed perspective on all of that is I keep thinking we're kind of in a soft landing transition where increased demand in fossil fuels is not going to be pushed to the point where prices increase dramatically because we're seeing the advent of renewables. So in this transition phase, which will probably be about a 25 year process, we're gonna see Production steadily decline in fossil fuels, but prices remain relatively steady. Um, and then of course, production in renewables increase and prices go, go way down. Um, so well, that's- historic, Historically, oil prices have been very cyclical, right? It's, it's been yeah. boom and bust, boom and bust. And you know, I think, I don't know if the cycles will be, I, I think there's the, the environment for those cycles to be more acute um, as companies overinvest and then the demand falls out. Um, but but that's hard to predict whether those cycles will be more acute or or whether they'll they'll kind of even out and and they'll be better planning and, and be more stable. Yeah, I've seen when you saw the cyclical boom bust of a particular fossil fuel, it tended to go across all lines you know, coal, natural gas, oil, if there was a boom time, it was a boom time in all. Right. Um, I think putting in renewables in quantity, which does not follow the same industry dynamics mm -hmm. is going to be, so if you get a boom time in oil because prices are high, you're probably gonna see a corresponding boom time in solar and wind because it's cheaper to get energy from those sources. And then if you see a bus time, so I think they tend to mitigate each other. You know, yeah. one's yeah. booming while the other one's busting and one's busting while the other one's booming and, and they tend to even out the prices that way. So if I were giving you an uninformed prediction, I would say you will not see those kind of predictable boom busts like we've seen in the last century. Um, Oh, China, speaking of boom bust, China's gonna cause coal prices to go down due to increased production and exporting. I don't know if I agree with that. This is just a prediction um, that they're giving forth. I'm, I'm wondering what are they gonna export it to? I mean, coal is pretty much just used in, in um, you know, steel and aluminum production and electricity. So in the U.S., for instance, we're shutting down a lot of coal power plants. Mm -hmm. We don't care if China's giving away the coal for free. It's, it just doesn't have a market. That, that sounds odd to me. I mean, being here in Kentucky, we used to export coal to them for years and years. Now, I, I haven't looked into it in a couple of years, but there used to be a big industry in getting the excise tax from the coal that we exported to China back. Um, I didn't think they made enough in China to, to cover their own production, to be honest unless that's changed a lot. Well, the article said China sort of went all in on mining. I think the issue with China is the economics don't really play into it. Mm -hmm. More a matter of, you know, government policy. So maybe artificially, who knows? I mean, right now they're shutting down their plant. We've got a plant over in China that gets shut down for a week out of the month, I think, because they're cutting off the electricity, which is primarily coal driven. So I mean, yeah. I, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with this prediction. I'm just passing it along, just like the internet. It doesn't have to be true. I'm just going to repeat it, right? Um, okay, there are going to be tremendous advancements in battery technology. I think that's pretty self-evident. Um, 
uh, increased demand in portable solar products. So I think we're seeing some of that, but basically where solar is integrated into, you know, I don't know, phone charging stations, laptop, whatever, we've seen some of that. Um, I think we'll see more of it. Uh, and uh, the solar labor shortage will continue. So that's, a, that's an issue just like any kind of skilled trade labor shortage seems to be a thing at the moment, especially when you talk about the uh, traditional vocational trades, plumbing, electricians, engineers, there seems to be a huge um, lack of folks. So those were the industry expert predictions. Now for a definite non-industry expert prediction, um, I'll, I'll give you my five when I was thinking about, and, and my criterionum was kind of thinking, what are we gonna see or talk about that we haven't seen or talked about as much in the past? So that was kind of where I was coming from, rather than saying solar's gonna grow and continue to grow, prices are gonna go down, whatever. Um, and some of these we've already talked about in past discussions, but I really think we're gonna see a lot about virtual utilities, sort of the rise of the virtual utility. And, um, and that's where you're aggregating production facilities in the distributed marketplace, whether that be distributed solar, distributed wind, distributed battery backup, all of those are gonna be used to aggregate together and form virtual utilities. We're seeing this with some of the existing utilities, but I think we're gonna to start to see other players like, like the Silicon Valley crowd, you know, basically the Teslas, the Microsofts, the Cisco's of the world going in and saying, you know what, I wanna get into the utility market. I don't even need to build a power plant. I can aggregate existing production facilities. Uh, and I can begin to somehow use my market recognition, use my software skill and all of that to create virtual utilities. Jay, wasn't that Enron? Enron was I mean, more, that, yeah, they were, they were more about working with- They were market. buying and selling, they, they were making, that's what I'm saying, but I'm just curious that it, the, the, what you're describing to me sounds a little bit like a market maker. Somebody yeah. just, I'm buying power from here and I'm doing it there, which is, and I don't know anything about Enron one way or another, but I, I know that they've got a bad rap, obviously. I don't know if they were doing good. It sounds like they're doing bad stuff, manipulating stuff. But on the other hand, it's if you get the Silicon Valley guys, I can't, you know, I, I, I don't see them as being particularly more virtuous than the guys in Texas. No, no, they're not. I mean, sure, this is going to lead to problems. I think Enron's biggest problem was their... Um, it was their accounting thing. And as you as accounting, the mark yep. to market kind of. Per they thing they were doing some things that were, let's say on the cutting edge of, of accounting technology. <laughs> yeah. Well, what they would say is, and the example I always loved is if somebody goes, you know what, we should start selling air. People will buy air. That's going to be a billion dollar industry. And they go, oh, billion. Okay. We have a billion dollars in assets because we came up with the idea and it's going to be worth a billion dollars. And let's sell 1% sell to a related company to establish the price. Right. And then you start yeah. and then you move. If it doesn't follow through, you move it to another subsidiary corporation yeah. and then declare that corporation. So it was all a lot of smoke and mirrors. And, and I love the reality of how that whole house of cards fell down. Because I read, I read a whole series of articles about this, and, and it was basically one woman reporter in the financial industry. And, and mm -hmm. these guys would do the, we're the smartest guys in the room kind of thing, and they'd explain this stuff. And she kept raising her hand going, okay, I don't understand what you're talking about. Could you explain this to me? And they're mm -hmm. kind of, well, little lady, clearly you just are not as sophisticated as we are. We'll take it offline. And she'd go, wait a minute. Okay, sure. I'm an idiot. Tell it to me like an idiot can understand it because I don't understand how this can possibly work. And eventually it was like that emperor's got no clothes and eventually other people go, you know, she may have a point because I don't really understand this either. So anyway, all right, so virtual utilities. Yeah, you're gonna start seeing the largest. My prediction is that within five years, the largest utility in the United States will not own one single power plant, um, which will be interesting. That'll be interesting. Um, 
Okay, uh, load control at the customer level. That's gonna be a big, big thing. So just as we've been dealing with supply side issues, I think you're gonna see uh, responsive load. You know, we're already seeing this with the smart um, service panels, uh, the smart circuit breakers, all of that. And everything's moving to a phone app where you can begin to do load control um, of your own household or your own business remotely. And then you can begin to see how can I, how can I match up my supply of energy with my demand of energy on a customer by customer basis something that the utilities have always had to deal with. How do we match customer demand with supply? Now we're gonna start seeing the end user. How can I match my supply to my demand? And, and that's gonna be a huge, a huge change in perspective and how we, how we consume energy. And I just don't know where all the ramifications are with that, but, but I think it's gonna be pretty dramatic. Kind of intelligent, making our energy system more intelligent uh, or less, depending on who's running it. <laughs> so um, I think fleet electrification is gonna be a big thing. We, we got a little bit of that from Tony. You know, Tony's the guy with the battery, uh, with the charging station business. And he's really looking towards how do I start selling these chargers to fleets? And we start to see school bus fleets that can be fully electric, um, FedEx, Uber. You know, Uber's not really a controlled, centrally controlled fleet. But when you start seeing UPS, FedEx, the Postal Service, school buses seem a natural to me because they sit idle most of the day. Um, and how can we make those into virtual utilities? So the fleet electrification is something where just like with solar, we started seeing industrial and utility scale is where the biggest activity was before individual household distributed. I think we're gonna see the electrification of vehicles happening at the fleet level in large way before it filters down to the individual um, owner, consumer. Um, solar and batteries. The integration of solar and batteries, this is one that I'm kind of doing a nod to the obvious, is everybody's going to be integrating batteries into their solar um, arrays at the customer level. Uh, we need some sort of storage capacity that sort of goes along with load control, but it also goes along to uh, the public utility commissions, making it less lucrative to connect into the grid as, as a whole. So, and that the electric vehicle is gonna be integrated into that battery pretty, pretty uh, substantially like the Ford Lightning that we talked about yesterday. And then one of my pie in the sky that I don't see happening in the next year necessarily, but maybe we'll start to hear about it in concept. And I get shot down a lot, mostly by my wife on this is the, indiv the individualizing of mass transit, okay? So I'm basically saying when we think of mass transit, we think of trains or buses or something like that that goes along a fixed route and carries many passengers. I'm saying with the advent of electric vehicles and autonomous driving vehicles, the mass transit system will be individualized to the point where a individual can take a individual vehicle and go somewhere individually through an app on their phone or collectively if they want a discounted price. And we'll begin to see many more vehicles. And, and Annie will always say, well, isn't that just going to add to congestion? And I'm like, yeah, damn right. It's going to add to congestion. It's going to add to problems. Sure. But I think there is a movement, a long-term movement away from ownership of vehicles, especially people who live in urban environments because parking is an issue. Uh, Uber is the first step in that, but I think we're moving towards, if I wanna go from A to B, I don't call a taxi or whatever, I just go on my phone and say, I wanna go from here to there and an autonomous vehicle will show up and my phone, I'll wave it in front of the door. It'll open up because I've already paid for it and I'll get in. 
and I can choose whether I'm going to share the ride or take it on my own, depending on how much I pay. And it's going to take me either along a fixed route or an individualized route, depending on which option I made. And all of that will be centrally controlled. And, and an, automated, an automated driving Uber pod to pick you up? Yeah, I could see that. Sure. Electric. And when it's not in use, it sits in a parking space and is recharged wirelessly. Um, you know, and there will be many of these spaces scattered around. So it's an electric solar powered for the most part, electric vehicle that is self dispatching driverless and uh, um, Would you feel comfortable having a self driving car drive out to your place. Well, it's never going to happen in the rural environment. I mean, we just have to assume that those of us who live in the sticks are not going to see the benefit of almost any of these technologies. Just like when they talk about 5G, I'm going, when am I going to get actual broadband? You know, I I would, Mm -hmm. I don't care about 5G. I just want to actually be able to connect to the internet. So, um, you know, yeah, this is an urban kind of thing, um, primarily. Mm -hmm. That's, that's okay. where those things are going to happen. But um, I don't know. That's my vision. I mean, I think what we have to do, you always say, well, mass transit doesn't work in the United States or whatever. Say, it doesn't work under its current design. Well, why, why is it? Why is it that people don't use it? You know, and, and once you start looking at, well, people like the convenience of going where they want to go, when they want to go by themselves. Well, can we not design using existing technology a system that meets the desired outcomes of the customer rather than trying to change the the customer to meet our system? We should change the system to meet the customer's demands, you know? So, yeah. Hey, Bob? You're still muted, Bob. (laughs) There you go. As I said in the past, Tesla is building a supercomputer. I think they've come to the conclusion that a, an autonomous car is not enough to not crash into things during snowstorms and stuff like that. Um, so what they're doing is they're building a supercomputer with a, a super software to control the cars, um, be autonomous and use uh, both technologies, the technology of, of the car, but they're also, and they're getting pretty close to, uh, and they're already in the trials on it. And I personally thought from the very beginning, the only way they're going to do that is by doing this uh, supercomputer. So that's in the future. Yeah, I, you know, sometimes I'll think, do I really want to trust the machine? to drive without without a driver but then i think do i really want to trust a driver either you know so yeah we trust a lot of machines to do things you know that that if we really thought about it would we really trust the elevator to operate without a controller you know it used to be nobody trusts that would have been somebody going really you got to have a a elevator operator you know but we Uh, don't we're at the point now that airlines are not crashing anymore. They have got the technology up to the point where planes in the worst conditions, weather conditions are landing by themselves. Yeah, I was surprised. I was surprised that most of the boats, you know, the large cargo ships are remotely controlled when they come into docking. That basically the harbor master sends out signals and takes control of the ship and brings it in and takes it to the proper unloading facility and and the captain i guess is just standing there in case something goes wrong so so we have a lot of the reason i found out about this is i was reading a book about crime in the 21st century and some mit professor went out with his students and hijacked the signal and and took these luxury yachts and brought them into a remote dock and basically said hey guys you've all been kidnapped and we've just stolen your boat because these guys didn't know where they're going. You know, they just took control of their ship. So um, they were doing it as a demonstration. They didn't really kidnap them, I assume. <laughs> I, I was going to add, I, I agree with your model uh, for transportation, but I would add that quadcopters are an easier autonomous solution than, uh, than 
vehicles. And yeah, somebody was talking to me, I was just trying to remember about, yeah, within an urban environment, they were talking a lot about drone. Oh, I remember it was a certification program guy. Yeah, the, a, a company, an organization called Space Tech, they do a lot of the NASA um, and now of course, SpaceX certifications for the materials. And they're getting big into these um, drone, um, autonomous drone, systems within urban environments. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're looking at it for transportation and delivery and you know whatever else. But, but their vision is that we're gonna see a whole bunch of drones flying around all these cities, so. And all, all of that is going to generate a greater demand for um, energy, not, not a lower demand for energy. Um, those will be very energy intensive. Yeah. And so I think, I think our, our demand for energy will only go up. Mm -hmm. And the value of uh, two-dimensional on surface versus drones is that a traffic jam can come to a dead stop, but drones are going to, I suppose they can just sit there and idle in the air, but. Sure, yeah. and, and you have three dimensions to work with versus just two, so it's a, you have infinite more degrees of freedom. Yeah, and you don't need to have surfaces like roads. So right. you basically, you've increased your two dimension and then you've increased your three dimension. Right. Yeah, that's gonna be interesting. I don't know if it's gonna be better, you know? I don't wanna make those value judgments, but I, it'll, be, it'll be interesting. <laughs> so um, let's see, anybody else have any, any predictions? Yeah, Jay? Well, mine's not a prediction, it's a question. Um, just our house has a, we're wire and circuit broken and whatever for 50 amp uh, charger. I have a 40 amp cord to the car because the leaf and the volt only take 30 amps. But if you pulled in with a 80 amp uh, Ford pickup truck, is that truck gonna know what the capacity is? And if not, are we gonna have people blowing up uh, charger stations? Yeah, I think what what their projection was, they've got two different charging stations. I think one's a 16 amp and one's an 80 amp. So you'd have to actually wire that 80 amp. You'd have to have the wire, you know, gauge wire big enough to handle that amperage draw um, to get to the wiring station from your service panel. So it's not just something, unless the wiring capacity was up to the charging station, then yeah, as soon as you use that charging station, you're gonna blow the wire. So if you've only got, let's say, most homes have 12 gauge wire in the wall. Uh, and I think that's typically um, considered, what, 20, 20 amps? Is that pretty much the limitation? So they'll often put a 15 amp fuse or breaker in there just because of the 25% the rule from the NEC. So I guess uh, what I'm wondering is if you would, if the truck had a setting so I could dial it and say 40 amps is okay, or I put a new charging cord on and say 50 amps is okay, because you know we ran the eight gauge or six gauge, I don't remember what it was, but it's got a, a, a 50 amp circuit breaker. Yeah, I don't know. I, I would think that it would be a matter of when you first install that charging station, you better make sure all the wiring meets its maximum capacity or you're not gonna be NEC compliant. I guess it's more a question that can you, can you dial down the truck so it will only take 40 amps or 50 amps? Yeah, I, I know you can do that um, within the charging station itself. You can set those uh, to charge over a longer period. Yeah, Bill? Um, yeah, I wouldn't <clears throat> be, be surprised if firmware on these high amp chargers is such that it measures the voltage with no current flowing and then sees how it sags when current is flowing. And if it sags too much, it'll say, aha, the wire is too small. I mean, that seems to be a very easy uh, software uh, check, you know, and I wouldn't be surprised if, if they have that already. But if you wired an 80 amp charger to a 12 gauge wire, you're already in violation oh, of the National Electrical Code. So whether it works or not, it would not be a proper installation. 
So Eric, do you have a comment? Yeah, I know the Teslas, you can basically set up how fast you want them to charge. So if you're trying to keep your rates low and you're gonna be home for 10 hours, you can set them to charge, full charge at 10 hours. So I'm thinking that would probably be copied with the lightning and so on. Second thing I'm seeing is probably what they're gonna be doing is supply side connections for charging stations, because otherwise you're gonna be reaching capacities real quick. Yeah, I would think that's true on that ADM for sure. Um, most of the charging stations, the, the level two charging stations we're seeing are, are not ADM. I mean, they're what I've seen mostly, you'll see that they want a 40 amp or a, uh, maybe a 50 amp circuit. You were saying, Bill, I think, didn't you say you had a 16 amp uh, charger? which would be pretty small. I know the level one chargers are certainly gonna be less than 20 amps because they're designed to just plug into a regular 120 outlet. But um, I, I've, I've looked to see, when I've looked at level two chargers, I think the recommendation is they at least, you, if you don't know what charger you're gonna use, put in a 50 amp circuit for that charging station. Um, that's been safe in the past, but now the Ford Lightning, because it's such a beast, is up there around 80 amps. And uh, so our, our, our 50 amp rule of thumb may no longer be the case, because my guess is it's just going to get bigger and bigger. It's like boom boxes in the 80s. We're going to start seeing, um, you know, more meat on these things. Um, so... Anybody have another prediction? Bill, you have one? I don't have a prediction, but I'd like to share my screen on a project that I may undertake, namely solar on a 20 foot container. Okay, go ahead and you want me yeah, can you jump in there? Yeah, uh, share. I'm gonna uh, cause this to move. Uh, you see, I have uh, 12, uh, 12, uh, 12 panels. And uh, it's it's a solar tracker, um, and it moves like this throughout the day. It parks horizontal at nighttime, um, and it could serve also as an awning if you wanted to have a outdoor seating place. Anyway, I've got the drawings done and all that stuff, and uh, it's a question of acquiring a, a container. And I have panels. I haven't. I think it'll be a 48 volt system. Um, I haven't spacked out the uh, charge controller or inverters yet, but uh, anyway, I thought I'd share that with you. Yeah, it looks pretty cool. What's the purpose of the container? Is this a mobile thing or what? Um, well, it, it would be parked somewhere and uh, maybe a mobile office, maybe power in, in, a, in a major, um, uh, power grid failure. Uh, they've actually done that in Houston, retrofitted some containers with solar for that, that purpose. They, they had huge lead acid battery packs and they unfortunately didn't fund maintenance for these things and all the, the 16 that were built are probably out of service now because nobody looked after the lead acid battery pack and they're kaput anyway. Yeah, I could see this thing being pretty amazing in a, in a, first responder catastrophe kind of way where you could load yeah, these absolutely. things up with supplies and have those panels yeah. fold either on the sides or on the top for transport. And then yeah. you get on site and you've got the whole energy plus plus distribution yeah. center. So yeah. I was yeah, curious. They've, they've got a couple at uh, Rice University that as you've described are in disrepair, but Rice might be interested in uh, you retrofitting them to make them uh, trackers. <laughs> hey, right. Jay, that, that kind of setup, um, could you do that on a different type of structure? Like let's say a garage or, you know, off of um, like a, a um, addition on your house? I would it... think so. I mean, Bill would be happy to patent this thing and then start selling it uh, everywhere. Yeah. I mean, what I assume that that tracking system is fairly straightforward, um, you know, that you're you're dealing with there. Yeah, I, I've done that already with an Arduino um, and it's pretty reliable. It's probably not really as hardened as industry requires, but uh, um, 
with regard to putting uh, a tractor on a roof, uh, I would always be concerned about wind loads. Uh, you know, that's a big deal down here. And uh, probably I was thinking more, everywhere, you know. more kind of a fixed like awning type of thing. But I didn't know if, if that the rules about, you know, edges of, of roof, you know, applied if you did an awning like solution. No, they typically don't because it's not considered, you know, the, the, when you're talking about the walkways and everything, that's really for firefighters to be able to walk on the roof so they can cut, cut vent holes through and things like that. So if it's an awning, it's, it wouldn't fall under that. I wouldn't think, I mean, you may have an inspector who decides to be silly about it, but, but it's not really a place a firefighter is going to go walk it. So right. that's that's a pretty interesting solution. I like that, Bill. Um, it looks like it's something that you could even treat it as a manual tracker, because um, because that if you're facing it uh, south, let's say you turn the unit south in a fixed environment, um, then it's just a seasonal adjustment as opposed to a daily adjustment. Um, you know, for the for the angle, uh, the altitude angle. And you could yeah. just go out there and, and set different, you know, just push that bar up and set it manually. Yeah, I had, uh, I had done something like that. If I can sh uh, uh, share my desktop again, let me see, I'm trying to bring it up. Yeah, I, I, uh, a long time ago, let me see, I need to go back to share desktop, um, share screen. Okay, yeah, this is, um, something I did a long time ago out of curiosity. Th this is strictly a CAD model, and you can see a huge number of uh, lead acid batteries on the trailer. And uh, I, I can't, uh, somewhere I have a gearbox and this, this is manually adjusted because, you know, it's after a, uh, a, a hurricane and it would be parked somewhere where they needed power and, um, uh, you can see a knob right there that turns a gearbox that gimbals the thing. And uh, this, this, this thing right here is for transportation. That is you lower it down to where it sits on top of this bar and then pivot this bar up to stabilize it. Uh -huh. uh, never built it, but I, you know, I, I do CAD. I'm, I'm pretty good at CAD making 3d models and what have you. And, and that, that was an, a, another alternative, but uh, anyway, let me see how to unshare my desktop here. <laughs> yep. Well, that looks pretty cool. I like those. So I'm going to start having you make some models for me here soon. <laughs> well, I'll be glad to do that. I, I, I may already have it built. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let me see the shop scale, shops there. Yeah. Okie doke. Well, we're coming to the end of the hour here. Anybody have anything else to add before we say adieu for the week? Yep. All right. So uh, we'll see you all next Tuesday. All right. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye.